Syllabus, thus speak or spoke, Saratustra. Um, uh, certainly, Nietzsche's most characteristic, <laughs> strange Nietzschean book. Um, and it's not very easy to lecture about, but <laughs> see what I can do. Um, I mean, it does seem like we ought to have a course in this department where you read those, so someone's got to do that. Uh, <laughs> um, just for the chronology. So the untimely meditations, once again, was uh, 1873 to 1876. Um, and then between that and Zarathustra, he published a number of things, uh, Human Alt to Human, Daybreak, and the Gay Science. Um, and then so uh, the publication history of this is a little bit weird. Uh, I, so uh, originally he planned he planned to have three parts, and he thought it was going to have three parts up until the time he finished the third part. And the first three parts were published. They were actually initially published as separate volumes, um, and that was in 1883 and 84. And then uh, after he finished writing the third part, he got it into his head to write another part. And he eventually was thinking of writing uh, five or six parts, but <laughs> the only one he ever wrote was part four. So but part four was, so it was written in 1885. And he had it printed in a limited edition and sent to his friends at some time. I guess it was also in 1885 or shortly thereafter, but it wasn't actually published until 1892. And if you remember the timing of Nietzsche's like breakdown was that was 1889. So 1892 means it was published by his sister. He actually didn't want it to be published, apparently. So um, now, I mean, part four is, is really interesting. And I guess if we had another week, well, I don't know, probably if we had another week there, had something else to sell us before that. But anyway, <laughs> if we had lots more time, we would read part four. But, um, but it seems like parts one through three are a definite unit. He conceived that as, as you know, um, an independent entity, and uh, so uh, and parts one to three are definitely long enough. <laughs> so that's why we're only reading parts one to three, not part four. Um, and then after this, as I mentioned, he published um, uh, several more things before the end, before the end of his authorship, including Beyond Good and Evil and Genealogy of Morals. That was 1886 and 87. Um, so, uh, um, so this isn't like necessary. I mean, it isn't like the final summary of Nietzsche's views or something like that. Uh, if there could be such a thing, even this wouldn't be it because there's lots of stuff that, uh, you know, important things that he doesn't discuss until Beyond Good and Evil and Genealogy of Morals. Um, but, uh, 
but still, I think, especially given the people we've read before in this course, that you know that this actually is a good place to end. Um, and as I said, it is probably his most characteristic work. It's most unlike anything that anyone else has written. Um, okay, so who is Zarathustra? Um, Zarathustra is, you know, that's just another name for the Persian prophet Zoroaster. Um, however, uh, this the choice of Zoroaster or Zarathustra as a character here probably doesn't have much to do with what we would think of as the historical um, Zoroaster, but it probably does have something to do with this weird ancient book. So there's this book called the Chaldean Oracles. Sometimes called the Chaldean Oracles of Zoroaster. So it's, you know, origin is pretty murky. I don't think anyone, you know, nowadays thinks that it's like uh, actually due to Zoroaster or someone near his time. But uh, um, it's kind of part, there was a whole like industry of, you know, work supposedly by Pythagoras, supposedly by Hermes Trismegistus, you know, like whatever. <laughs> so uh, this is part of that literature. Um, and uh, it was, uh, it was quoted a lot by ancient Neoplatonists and uh, alluded to and sometimes often and sometimes quoted by Emerson. Um, and I guess alluded to also by Thoreau. I guess that's who, I didn't remember this when we were talking about Thoreau's uh, use of Zoroaster before, but I think Thoreau also is probably thinking about this Zoroaster from the Chaldean Oracles. It's a book of, I haven't read it. It's a good thing to read, but I haven't read it so far. Uh, but I think it's a book of kind of like um, um, what I'm for. Uh, it's a book of like sayings, like mystical sayings, basically. Uh, I guess some little stories and stuff mixed in. Um, I'm not even, I guess it makes sense that Nietzsche would have read it or could have, I mean, obviously his, his group was up to it, you know. Uh, um, but on the other hand, it's also possible that it's not even this Zoroaster that he's really thinking of so much as Emerson's. So he did actually write in the, there's a, there was a passage in, I think it's one of the essays, the second, Emerson's second series, where he tells this story about Zoroaster and Nietzsche in the margin of his copy next to that passage wrote, this is it. <laughs> so, um, so uh, like it's, as I said, it's possible that it's like, you know, a second hand from this Chaldean Oracles book. Um, so, uh, I mean, not that Zarathustra is like, or that Nietzsche thinks he's that similar to that Zoroaster either. He, he talks about this sometimes later. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, he says things like, well, this Zoroaster is the opposite of the historical Zoroaster. <laughs> so, um, so I don't know, maybe if I had around the Chaldean oracles, I would really have more to say about that. But all I can say about it is uh, there are there were reasons why you picked this character, but they're kind of weird, murky reasons. It wouldn't like doing research on what people now think about Zoroaster. Well, yeah. I've read it somewhere that they say that Zoroaster was the first, like, I guess, thinker who, who made a sharp difference between good and evil. 
like he came up with a distinction, like he yeah based on the distinction. I, I you know I doubt we know that really. <laughs> you know, I mean it's pretty like. I mean, I think we barely know there actually was a person named Zoroaster, you know, or like, or like what century he lived in, or, you know, I, and, um, yeah, and I mean, it's pretty hard, I think, I think it would, I think it's pretty hard, it would be pretty hard to decide whether, or, you know, like Zoroaster first, first thought that, or, or, or even what, like whether people have just always thought that. <laughs> yeah. I, so, I mean, I would be skeptical about a claim like that, basically. Uh, you know, ancient texts are really hard to date. The actual text, you know, the, the Zend Avesta, the, the sacred scripture of Zoroastrianism, like, doesn't even, I mean, there, there are still Zoroastrians, but the, the, the Zend Avesta doesn't even survive in, in its completeness. It's like, Fragmentary. So, yeah. Um, um, uh, well, yeah. So I don't know, but I mean, of course, I I think I, I think it is true that Nietzsche probably thinks that about Zoroaster. In fact, I think that's one of the things he says about it later. That since Zoroaster was the one. I mean, I don't know if he means he was the first one to say there's such thing as good and evil, but I think he says something like the first one to introduce a metaphysical machinery of good and evil or something like that. That therefore he would have to be the one to overcome it. And that's why he was. But, you know, I'm also not sure he was thinking that when he wrote this book or he only thought that later. <laughs> anyway. Um, Okay, I mean, I guess a different question about Zor the characters are asked in the book is, is he like a spokesperson for Nietzsche? Is he just channel, you know, saying the things that Nietzsche wants to say? So, I mean, um, when I talk about it, I'm going to sometimes be assuming that, I guess, but it's actually a really tricky question. I mean, first of all, it's a tricky question because Nietzsche himself is not a reliable spokesperson for Nietzsche. <laughs> like Nietzsche will say things, but, and you're not sure whether Nietzsche really believes in them or he's saying them for some other reason. So even more so if he has Zoroaster say them, uh, or Zarathustra, I guess I should call him from now on. Um, um, and for that matter, it's also not so clear that Zarathustra is uh, the character is a reliable spokesman for, for Zarathustra, right? He actually says at the end of part one or near the end, right before he leaves his disciples, he warns them, you know, I may have deceived you. <laughs> right? So, um, so, so, um, yeah, so, there can't really be such a thing as, as someone in this authorship that we can, I mean, I think to a certain extent that's true, even at the early stage of the untimely meditations. Um, but it's, but it's definitely gotten worse by the time we get to this. It's just not clear. And it's, um, yeah, it's, I mean, Nietzsche is saying stuff to someone but it's not clear exactly why he's doing it or what, you know, what audience he's speaking to and what effect he intends to have on that audience and why. <laughs> um, right, so I mean, that makes it different than like, for example, Schelling. Does it, it's probably not, maybe not that different from Emerson, but it's definitely different from Schelling or Coleridge where you feel like, they think something is true and they're saying it because they want you to think it's true. <laughs> and then it may be hard to understand what they're saying, but at least it's easy to understand what they're doing. Right? But with someone like Nietzsche, it's, uh, you know, the problem starts before that. So, okay, I mean, that's kind of like wiggling out of the question, but, um, 
But I guess, I mean, something else I could say about it is that if we think of Nietzsche as um, um, the author of this book from beginning to end, then Zarathustra can't exactly be identical to Nietzsche because Zarathustra appears to learn things as the book goes on. Right, like, um, I mean, that's very explicit at the beginning, where, where he first comes down and tries to speak to the masses, and it doesn't work. And, you know, um, then he tries speaking or being a companion with a corpse, <laughs> but then he realizes that that's no good, he needs living companions, right? So, um, so, uh, like, uh, presumably, uh, that process of changing from one thing to another is, you know, like, at best, he's getting closer to what Nietzsche thinks he should say or do, something like that. Um, and it's less explicit as the book goes on, but I think, but it, but it does keep coming up that Zarathustra seems to um, learn from his experiences and change his mind about what's the best way to proceed. This. So, uh, well, and more about, about more than just what the best way to proceed is. Uh, I mean, you know, at a certain point, he has this terrible revelation about the nature of the eternal occurrence. So we haven't got to that yet. But I guess, you know, um, Nietzsche knew to begin with that that was coming up. <laughs> so, um, so it's not the same as Zarathustra. I mean, you know, uh, for the same reason you can say, and I do say that Descartes is not the same as the character of the meditator in the meditation. So, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't imply anything particularly unusual to say that, but it is worth keeping, right? Because Descartes, the meditator, doesn't know, am I going to be able to doubt everything? Is there going to be one thing I can't doubt, you know, et cetera? Whereas Descartes, obviously, um, before he started writing, I already knew where he was going. So, um, I mean, it could be somewhat, to some extent, autobi autobiographical, like this is a process we went through before, but it can't be, it's not, they're not literally the same, that character and the author are not literally the same. Um, okay, that's about all I can say about that, and I'm probably going to be saying that a lot when I talk about this book. So, you know, I mean, I'm, so I'm not obviously going to try to um, summarize everything that happened in this reading or something. <laughs> I'm going to talk about certain things that come up. Um, so, I mean, so first of all, the overall plot, right? Zarathustra, the book starts, and this, I mean, maybe something even to say about the first sentence here, about how little I understand the first sentence and what a difficult problem there is with reading, what difficult problems there are with reading this book. When Zarathustra was 30 years old, he left his home in the lake of his home and went into the mountains. So Zarathustra, until he was 30, we don't know exactly what he was doing. <laughs> Later, he says some things about what he was doing before, um, but not very much. But anyway, until he was 30 years old, he was living, I guess, with other people, you know, near a lake. And then he left and he went up alone into the mountains and he stays up in the mountains for 10 years. But then one morning he realizes he's gonna have to go down and share his wisdom and he goes down, right, and then I think I, I pretty much, well, I, no, I guess I'll tell the rest of the story, right? He goes down, he tries to talk to the masses. It doesn't work. They laugh at him. Um, meanwhile, this rope 
tightrope walker basically, right? Or rope dancer, right? This tightrope walker falls off the rope <laughs> and dies, and it's Zara's stress, like, oh, because you lived for danger and died for danger, I'll bury you with my own hands. So he walks off into the wilderness carrying this corpse. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and he has sort of certain adventures with the corpse, but then he like eventually like he doesn't actually bury him with his own hands, right? In, in the end, he says like, "Oh, I think I've buried you well enough by putting you in this hollow tree." <laughs> but and that that's the point at which he realizes he has to he has to have companions, or I mean, it's interesting. What he says he's looking for is companions, but what he actually gets is disciples. Which is not exactly the same as companions. Um, but anyway, so he gets disciples and he gathers his disciples in a town called the Pied Cow, <laughs> where he gives them various discourses. Um, mostly, I guess we should think that he's talking to all of these disciples, so there's particular times, some of them he's talking to a particular person. Like the old woman who tells them if you're going to visit women, bring a whip. <laughs> and then, um, by the way, there's a famous picture of um, Gicha and someone else. Like, um, uh, pulling a cart. <laughs> With, uh, but this woman, what's her name again? Um, Salway, um, sorry, I'm confusing her with the last. Anyway, he's carrying a cart and she's got the whip. <laughs> so we're, uh, it's not, maybe it's not clear why you're bringing the whip when you whip the whip. In any case, uh, like who's going to get the whip? But in any case, so uh, yeah, so he gives them all these discourses, and then at the, at the end he says, "Okay, I've got to go back up the mountain." Bye. <laughs> I, no, actually, I guess he doesn't go back up the mountain right away, but he says, "I've got to leave." Bye. All right. So and that's the end of part one. So, but even as I said, just talking about that first sentence. So, I mean. Presumably, the things in this sentence stand for something, right? And I mean, I kind of understand them. I mean, that is, they stand for, well, what? They may stand for different things. Number one, they may stand for events in Nietzsche's own life. Uh, but number two, they stand for certain, um, like a movement from, conventionality to solitude, right? From, from living with other people to being by yourself. Um, and so in that, and in that context, I can understand why he's 30 years old approximately, like what that, that might mean something and why he goes up into the mountains where everything is clear and above all the mists and so forth. But like, what about the lake? Why is there a lake? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the sentence would sound different if there was no lake. That's for sure, right? If it just said when Zarathustra was 30 years old, he left his home and went into the mountains. That would not sound the same as when Zarathustra was 30 years old, he left his home and the lake of his home and went into the mountains. So I know it's different, but I can't say why or, or why that was might have been important. Yeah. I have one idea. Yes. So it's like there's the lake down there, right? And then there's the sun he's talking to up top. Yeah. So just Jung comes to my mind saying that the, the sun is the like very, very intensely conscious and then the lake is usually the, the unconscious just the symbols and that's that would be my idea first guess yeah so in Jungian 
<laughs> my wife always tells me this, that if you see water in a dream, it's a symbol of the unconscious. That's the human being for me. Yes, I know that. Um, uh, so I think it kind of goes up to the magnetic center. Yeah. So the sun. He leaves his unconscious down at the bottom. I mean, yeah, he leaves his depth. Why isn't it a sea then? Why is it a lake? Because later it says a lot about the sea. sea yeah. yeah, the sea becomes very important later in the book. Um, and yeah, I do feel like I would I would understand better what it was why it was mentioned if his home was on the sea coast or something, or if his home was an island, which also comes up a lot in you know, islands, in a lake. I mean, of course, I know a lot of the things Thoreau associates with lakes, <laughs> but uh, or well, ponds. Anyway, he calls them ponds, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. And I also feel like I also feel like it would probably be I mean, I'm not sure about this. I feel like it would probably be a mistake to go through every single thing that's mentioned in the book and try to say, you know, and the tree symbolizes this and the, you know, uh, I guess probably, although I know Heidegger now, I mean, Heidegger isn't necessarily the most trustworthy interpreter, but he is at least, I guess, always an interesting interpreter, you know. So uh, like later when, when Zarathustra sees his eagle, and with the eagle and the snake, we know Zarathustra himself says what they need, what they symbolize, right? Pride and, and uh, wisdom. <laughs> But uh, although you may feel like there's more to it than that, also, like, you know, like there's a point to using a snake to represent wisdom rather than an owl. <laughs> right? The owl of Minerva would be a much more familiar or like comfortable symbol of wisdom than a snake, which is this, this right? The snake is usually we say, we translate that word cunning, right? The most cunning of all the beasts. Um, so, but in any case, you know, when, he when Heidegger points out that the snake is like coiled around the eagle's neck, and he says that that's a sign of the eternal occurrence. You know, and I, I don't, I don't have anything to say against that. But I, on the other hand, I, I, I do feel, I mean, maybe because I feel like I'm not Heidegger, you know, I, at least for me, I feel like it would be a mistake to actually go through and try to figure out all of these things. Um, um, that you know, in fact, maybe one of the things that the lake of his home contributes to that sense is to give it a kind of. How to put this, but like to make it into a real fiction instead of just a, a like a symbolic statement, right? Like one of the reasons why if you took that part out, the sentence would sound different. Is that if you took that part out, it would it wouldn't sound like we're interested in this story, basically. It would sound like we're only interested in what it symbolizes. If you put the lake in, and yes, maybe you can make something of it. It has depths, it's water, you know, it's, it's, it's water that's lying in place rather than flowing over like light from the sun. I mean, maybe you can do something with it, but, but, I, but I feel like it's, main function of that sentence is actually just to uh, make it into a real picture. Um, but, you know, I'm not sure. So this book is hard to understand. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so, but in any case, um, so one thing I want to talk about is the audience for the book. Well, so first of all, Zarathustra himself has different audiences. We just said first he has the whatever people happen to be gathered in the market square. Now, I mean, the people who are gathered in the market square aren't exactly everyone. I mean, they don't include like permits and goat herds and a bunch of other people who aren't in the market square. But they're. It, at, at least they're everyone in the sense that Zarathustra has not chosen them. They just they, and they didn't show up to see Zarathustra either. They showed up to see the road to Um And so that's the main audience that Zarathustra talks to in the prologue. I mean, I, so like I guess according to the table of contents and the headings and whatever. Zarathustra's pro prologue is the whole first part of the book, right, until page 53 in this edition. Um, but according to the text, um, this is on page 47. So after he finishes talking about the ultimate men or the last men, as it's often rendered, and here ended Zarathustra's first discourse, which is also called the prologue. For at this point, the shouting and mirth of the crowd interrupted him. Right. So that um, so strictly speaking, the prologue is those two speeches he gives in the marketplace. And I guess you'd say like the title of that whole part of the book, Zarathustra's Prologue, is because it's the story of Zarathustra's prologue and what happened in before and after. The prologue is those two discourses in the marketplace, and the audience for them was the audience in the marketplace. And then after that, there's a part that's titled Zarathustra's Discourses. Um, and like at first we don't even know who he's talking to until the end of the first one this is right so the first one is called of the three metamorphoses and at the end on page 56 it says thus spoke zarathustra and at that time he was living in the town called the pied cow now again i've written i've read certain speculations on why the town is called the Pied Cow, but <laughs> I'm not sure if they're right. There's no explanation is given. It's not obviously the name of a real place <laughs> or like the name of any real place. Um, but yeah, I don't even know when they, when it, when he first, when it first mentions that he's talking to his disciples. At some point, it becomes clear that he has disciples and he's talking to them. I don't remember exactly where. So, um, so, the, so, like I said, therefore, the part that's called Zarathustra's discourses is apparently his discourses to his disciples. Um, again, except for a couple that seem to be stories about Zarathustra or things he said to other people. They don't all end thus spoke Zarathustra. They mostly do. So, okay. Um, why, am I, why am I talking about this? Well, so since Zarathustra's discourses are aimed at his disciples, that, but, um, that means that uh, everyone who reads the book is basically in the position of Zarathustra's disciples. Right? Like anyone who reads it becomes, has said to them the things that Zarathustra would only say to his disciples, not to the marketplace. 
So uh, it's actually easy to get admitted as a disciple. <laughs> All you have to do is buy this book. Now, um, I guess like one thing you could say in response to that is, oh yeah, but you have to understand them, right? Like his disciples are the people who understand these discourses. Now, of course, we're not sure whether anyone, including the disciples mentioned in the book, will count as disciples by that standard. So, um, and sure enough, the subtitle of the book is A Book for Everyone and No One. Right? That might be one way of understanding that subtitle. It's for everyone in the sense that anyone can read it and it will be addressed to them, but it's for no one because no one's going to understand. It. <laughs> um, uh, having said that, there's, there's, there's more going on here that I want to say at least what little I can about it, which is that um, it's, I think it's easy not to notice what I just said about how, like, you know, Zarathustra says, from now on, I'm not going to speak to people in general. I'm only going to speak to, to my disciples. And then you go on reading and you hear all the things that he only says to his disciples. And, you know, so like, you know, Nietzsche disagrees and thinks everyone can hear these things or, you know, or something. Right, but it's easy not to notice that problem that's happened. And I think the reason it's easy not to notice is that, and I think I mentioned this before, there's kind of a seductive technique that Nietzsche has, and not only Nietzsche, a lot of philosophers do something like this, where um, as you read it, you so want to be the person that they're talking to or talking about. <laughs> and they kind of like draw you in. They basically say, well, you and I know, right? That blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and you forget that, again, that, that, that anyone could be that you. All they have to do is buy the book. They don't have to buy it. They just have to download it from Live gym or whatever, <laughs> um, to get out of the library or, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, anyone can be that you. Um, but it's easy to forget that, and it's and and therefore it's like a, I think it's a very powerful technique for getting someone to um, at least consider adopting certain values, believing certain things. Um, and Nietzsche certainly does it a lot. So, you know, like a particular example, I guess, um, would be this section called Of the Flies of the Marketplace. It starts on page 78. It begins, flee, my friend, into your solitude. I see you defeated by the uproar of the great men and pricked by the stings of the small ones. So, Ray, right, like, I think when you read that, you want to think, oh, he's talking to me. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm oppressed by the great men and I'm pricked by the stings of the small ones. Yeah, I better flee into my solitude because I'm Zaratustra's friend and he's giving me advice, right? So, um, so uh, you know, um, and what? Well, I guess, I mean, I think he's banking on it. most, if not all, of his readers feeling that that could be addressed to them. I mean, you know, that's maybe not quite as strong a statement as it might sound, because after all, not everyone will read a book like this at all. But probably, you know, a lot more people will read a book like this than will read Schelling's <laughs> System of Transcendental Philosophy, right? Uh, I mean, you know, this, this is a book that 
I guess another reason it's weird to lecture about it is that you don't need lectures to read it. You can just read it. <laughs> um, so decide for yourself what it means, if anything. You know, so, but nevertheless, yeah, not everyone will read a book like this. Um, so, but, you know, yeah, I think almost everyone has probably, has it, you can at least get them to think about themselves this way. You know, boy, I'm just brought down by all this nonsense around me. All I flee to my solitude, right? You know, so, um, so I guess the question is, why is he doing it? Right, so I mean, I pointed out kind of a technique that he's using, but what is he using this technique for? So, I mean, you know, you could interpret it as kind of sinister. I mean, I've been almost been pushing it in that direction, right? Like, like it's kind of flattering his readers for some reason of his own. Um, and, uh, and in fact, that's what he goes on to say to his friend that he's talking to in that section. Um, they buzz around you even with their praise, and their praise is importunity. They want to be near your skin and your blood. They flatter you as if you were a god or a devil. They whine before you as before a god or a devil. What of it? They are flatterers and whiners and nothing more. So, uh, you know, um, you could think of this as being like Zarathustra's warning to his disciples that he may have deceived them, right? Like at the very point when he's in the middle of flattering you, he tells you to beware of flatterers. <laughs> but uh, if you don't catch the warning, you don't. So, I mean, that would be one way of reading it, but like another, I guess, are these two completely inconsistent? Probably not, but they're at least simple versions of them are inconsistent anyway. You could say, no, it's a pedagogical fiction. I mean, so like, this is a type of issue that comes up with reading Nietzsche constantly. I think sometimes it's kind of irreverently called the nice Nietzsche versus the nasty Nietzsche. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, um, yeah, can we trust him with our whatever investment of attention, uh, um, whatever it is we're putting into this? Is he using it for our benefit or not? So, you know, so I mean, you could say, look, this is a pedagogical fiction, and in fact, it's a fiction very much like the fiction of the meditations, where, you know, I mean, it's like, it's similar not only in technique, but in, but in content even to the fiction of the meditations, right? So again, like the meditation begins, you know, some years ago, I noticed that many of the things I believed were false, blah, 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 blah. And um, the importance of that is not to get you to know certain things about Descartes that some years ago he got to, I mean, there's a discourse on the method for that, right? The meditations is you're supposed to think these thoughts yourself. I think that's why it's written in the first person, right? I mean, you're supposed to think like, oh yeah, my senses have sometimes deceived me. How can I trust them, et cetera. So, um, um, and it, and the reason I say it's similar even in content is that, um, yeah, like the meditations, it tries, you know, the meditations tries to get you to know yourself by subtracting everything else and, right, fleeing to your solitude, so to speak. So, I mean, you could see this piece of, so, I mean, you could say, yeah, it really is aimed at everything. Um, if there is anything. And that's the same thing you can say about the meditations, right? Descartes doesn't prove that there are any other minds. If there are any, 
they can think these thoughts. So, uh, you know, that would be another way of interpreting the title. I look for everyone to know. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I can't claim to to be able to decide that question. I think the nice speech had an nasty speech. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I, could it be that he's trying to, because there's like lots of like details of the book that make me think of religion and the Bible, especially. Yes. And like God is that the time when he goes up the mountain in the Bible, the snake. Yeah. So could it be that he's trying to like, not, not like give an alternative or just like reform that? And then I guess that is kind of pedagogical, but. Yes. I mean, Descartes doing that too, of course. Uh, um. Um, I mean, right, like the, you know, the point of the meditations is, well, it's a good question. I mean, sometimes, most of the time, I think that really the point of it is just to provide a basis for Cartesian physics. <laughs> but at least he claimed in his preface to the Sorbonne that it was for the, it was mostly for the purpose of proving the existence of God and the immortality of the soul. But obviously, in a reformed way, so to speak. I mean, not, of course, in the re in reformed in the sense of Protestant, because he wouldn't have been writing that in the Sorbonne, but, <laughs> but some kind of reform. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, so of course, if Nietzsche is involved in that, he's, in, let's say he's involved in a more radical way. In some sense, it couldn't be any more radical than they talk, right? Like, how could you be more radical than that? But yeah, um, um, yeah. So no, I mean this, and this is this is definitely supposed to read like a scripture. Um, that's why I think I considered ordering the old Thomas Common translation, which translates this into biblical English. Right, like I mean, biblical English is a weird phrase since the Bible wasn't written in English, but <laughs> English of the King James translation, right? Um, with all the vowels. And, um, um, I'm not sure that's a mistake because I mean, it is. Um, we don't have a great year for this in German, but I think the German is also kind of, yeah, like biblical sounding. Um, old fashioned. Um, um, so, like the like the use of the, um, um, simple past tense rather than the, rather than the perfect um, stuff like that. So. Uh, yeah, so he is trying to do something like that, yes. But that doesn't really get to the question of who he's talking to. I mean, that I mean that it does get to it only by way of connecting it to similar questions about religious texts. <laughs> um, about, you know. Who can really understand them properly? Um, that was one of the issues in the Protestant Reformation about whether everyone should read the Bible or whether only it should only be read by its proper interpreters. Um, but it, I mean, but it's an issue that goes way beyond that. So. Um, 
just, I think, I guess I put it this way, that observation just raises the stakes. It's like, uh, now we understand why it, 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 it's really important to know whether he's talking to us or not, whether, or whether, whether he's really making everyone his disciple, or whether perhaps only a few people are his disciples, or perhaps no one. <laughs> Um, um, okay, yeah, I was going to say something towards the end. Now I'm wondering if I'm going to get to that, but if not, maybe I'll talk about it next time. I was going to say something towards the end about Nietzsche's atheism and materialism and how to understand that. I mean, um, that it's uh, not that he's not an atheist and materialist, but that doesn't mean exactly what he might think it means. <laughs> or that the, the, the context for it is, is not like who he's talking to when he says that is not, is not exactly who he might think or something like that. Um, but like I said, maybe I'll get back to that later. Okay, um, but for now I want to go on to this other thing, which actually, I mean, in a sense, it's a continuation of the same subject. But it, I mean, and it it shows that the text itself is about this problem in some way. So, because part one begins and ends by talking about the bestowing virtue. Um, I mean, it's called the bestowing virtue. Um, at the end, right? So the last discourse in part one is titled of the bestowing virtue. But um, um, But it's the topic at the very beginning. The first thing Zaratustra, so actually, I spoke a little bit inaccurately. Zaratustra's first audience is the sun. Before he talks to anyone in the marketplace, he talks to the sun, right? Great star, what would your happiness be if you had not those for whom you shine? Um, And uh, Zarathustra compares himself to the sun and says that just as the sun um, would have no happiness if it couldn't shine for someone, so too he you know, can't stand just keeping his wisdom to himself. He has to go down and bestow it on someone. Um, So one question about this bestowing virtue would be, why not just call it benevolence? Right, I mean, a bestowing virtue means to take things that you have and give them to others. Um, we already have a name for that virtue, benevolence. <laughs> um, right, I mean, as opposed to, right, as opposed to justice, these are the two main virtues, benevolence and justice. Um, uh, well, I mean, I guess they're kind of two of the four cardinal virtues, but they're the two main virtues in here, benevolence and justice. Um, and, uh, um, and Zarathustra says, page 94, So this is from the discourse called Of the Adder's Bite. Right? When first there's a story about Zarathustra being bitten by an adder. And then uh, getting the adder to take its poison back. <laughs> and his disciples 
um, ask him, what is the moral of your story? And at first he says, well, my story is immoral. <laughs> But then he says, when, however, you have an enemy, do not requite him good for evil, for that would make him ashamed, but prove that he has done something good to you, right? So it's, a, you know, like, so if someone has done something bad to you, you, uh, the, the just response would be do something bad back to that. Um, so, but Zaratustra in this story is saying, no, you shouldn't do that. But I mean, that is, he's assuming to begin with that you shouldn't do that, so to speak, right? That he says, do not requite him good for evil, right? So you might think if you weren't going to do this, you would do this, and this would mean give them back something good. And it's, instead, he says, but prove that he has done something good to you. So, um, uh, right, like basically pretend, well, not pretend, prove that it wasn't actually harm and therefore it doesn't have to be required. Okay, I mean, so there's a lot to say about that, but so, um, um, so as he discusses this, the topic of justice in general, I mean, this is probably a bad way to put it this way, because it's not so weak as the transition as I'm implying, right? But the topic of justice in general comes up, so to speak. Um, and he says, I do not like your cold justice. Tell me where justice, which is love with seeing eyes to be found. But eventually he says, but how can I be just from the very heart? How can I give everyone what is his? So justice is to give to each his own. I guess I should say, give to each their own. Right? This is Simonides' definition, the poet Simonides. I don't know if Simonides himself really intended this as a definition, but it's quoted in the Republic in book one as the first attempt at a definition of justice give to each their own. And as the Republic continues and as the history of philosophy continues, basically this can, everyone basically continues to agree that this is the definition. They just disagree about what it means to get to each their own. <laughs> right. So, um, so, but Zaratustra says, how can I give everyone what is his? Let this suffice me. I give everyone what is mine. <laughs> so, so it's not justice, but it sounds a lot like this. Yeah. Is there some like necessity involved? Is it at least with the sun example, it sounds like there's a necessity to bestow virtue from one side to the other. And even in the case of like the quote that you mentioned, and I have to find something to be mine. It seems there's a necessity to do it because otherwise, what can I do that makes any sense? Yeah, so. I mean. So there definitely is a necessity to it. And the metaphor of the sun emphasizes which is also, you know, the metaphor, again, in the Republic, <laughs> hey, of the form of the good and the way it emanates its goodness to everything, and it does not, like, decide to do that. Um, so, you know, when Zarathustra says to the sun, like, great star, what would your happiness be if you didn't, it's, it's, it's not, he doesn't say, like, how could you choose not to shine or something? That's not, you know. Um, now, and I mean, that sounds weird if you think that virtue shouldn't be something that necessitates action. But 
Zarathustra presumably thinks that virtue is something that necessitates action, right? Like to have this bestowing virtue is to be unable not to bestow because it's your virtue. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's the right, I think that's the right thing to say about that. There is some necessity in all times. Um, to have, if, if you really have a virtue, then that virtue is, is, is you, it's your nature. Um, as Saratusha sometimes says, then there's a problem if you have more than one virtue. They'll fight with each other. They all want to be your nature. <laughs> but at least if you only have one, then it's, yeah, then it's necessity. Um, um, okay, but anyway, so I want to get back to this question. So why not just call the bestowing virtue benevolence? Well, I mean, first of all, there is some problem with giving virtues names. Um, right, this is mentioned in the section about joys and passions. And it begins, my brother, if you have a virtue, and it is your own virtue, you have it in common with no one. There again, the sun is a good metaphor for that, right? The sun is the classic example of something where there's only one of a certain species, uh, then Locke points out that if you were as close to one of the other stars as the sun, perhaps you would say it was the same species, <laughs> so on and so forth. But in any case, right, the sun is the classic example of something where there is no other of the same species. If you have a virtue and it is your own virtue, you have it in common with no one. To be sure, you want to call it by a name and caress it. You want to pull its ears and amuse yourself with it. And behold, now you have its name in common with the people and have become of the people and are heard with your virtue. You would do better to say, unutterable and nameless is that which torments and delights my soul and is also the hunger of my belly. Right, so like, um, So, you know, it's hard to know how to, how to take that. I mean, it's, uh, so on the one hand, by kind of straightforward logic, you could say, and therefore, if your one virtue is something like benevolence, don't call it benevolence, because if you call it benevolence, then you're just one of the herd, and, it's, and you're not talking about your own virtue anymore. This is like, uh, um, uh, pretty familiar Emersonian type of thought. Um, so, I mean, maybe you can even somehow connect that with Emerson saying that, you know, like I've been my poor and right, that, that if, um, if he's going to help people, he doesn't want it to be in the name of philanthropy. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, on the other hand, Zarathustra doesn't seem to be too worried about applying all kinds of other names of virtues to himself, like wisdom. Um, I guess wisdom is the main one, or pride. If he's, I mean, Frank Aristotle is a virtue, at least, right? Like magnanimity, like mag. <laughs> um, so, uh, so uh, truthfulness, courage, I believe he attributes to himself somewhere or other. Um, and even, and justice too, even though he denies in that one place I read, he says, how can I be just from my very heart? Um, So, uh, so maybe they're actually, he's not calling benevolence because it really is pretty different from what is traditionally thought of as benevolence in some way. 
And I'm not sure that answer is good either because that might also apply to all those other pictures, the way Zaratustra uses them. But in any case, I mean, there are certain differences. So I'm just going to talk about those and maybe this is why not to call it that. So, I mean, for one thing, it's not evenly bestowed on everyone. So that's why I said that, that like, in a way, we're continuing the topic of, the, of like what I was talking about before, about the audience and so forth. The sun, you know, so this is part of the portrayal of the sun that is, like, not at all. This is the opposite of what the sun would usually symbolize. When you know when he says, "What would your happiness be if you had not those for whom you shine?" So normally the sun symbolizes like emanation to everything, and everything receives according to its capacity. But uh, but on the side of the sun, it's the same. Um, so you might expect to say, you know. Great star, what would your happiness be if you had not those for whom you shine? But luckily for you, you have everyone. <laughs> so, but instead, he says, if you have come up here to my cave for 10 years, you would have grown weary of your light and of this journey without me, my eagle, and my servant. <laughs> right? So it turns out that the sun was shining only for Zarathustra and his eagle and his serpent according to Zarathustra. Um, and um, in, a, in a sense, that's also like, that's the thing that Zarathustra has to first learn about himself, right? I am not the mouth for these ears, meaning um, like, I can't exercise my bestowing virtue on these people. They can't receive it. Um, so, I mean, that if you take that seriously, now at least, I mean, well, you have to take it seriously, but I mean, if you take that in a straightforward way, right? Because of the, the example of the sun makes you all, makes you worry about it. Like, it's, just, it's not literally true. But the sun only came up into the sky to get the Zarathustra's cave. Is it? <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, even when he lived down by the lake of his home, when there was no one up on the mountain, the sun still rose and set every day, right? Like, so, um, so is you know when he says that the sun rose and set for me, is that like? Are we supposed to understand that as a statement about the sun or as a statement about Zarathustra that he's like capable of taking on that gift or something like that? Um, there's a similar passage in Walden where Thoreau says that uh, part of his job was to be present at the sun's rising every day. He would meet his it's like many of my neighbors coming home from Boston in the dusk, or would it, would it probably saw me going out to this duty and didn't realize, <laughs> right? So but then he says, you know, it is true that I never was materially assisted in this rising. Nevertheless, it is of the last importance that I be there. <laughs> so, um, you know, so you could see it kind of like that. Then, um, that would fit into more of the idea that this is a book for everyone. But you're supposed to read it as if Nietzsche wrote it just for you. If you could, if you could, if you can read it as if Nietzsche wrote it just for you, then it is just for you, or something like that. So I don't know, but in any case, like taking it in a more literal way to say that no, the bestowing virtue, as Nietzsche understands it, is not bestowing on everyone. I mean, I guess either way, it's different from, from the way you usually think about benevolence, right? Like from the way Hume or Locke would think about benevolence, let's say, right? Which is that um, um, 
it's not just, I mean, it, first of all, it's not true that you give it to everyone equally. Um, it's uh, like, of course, everyone knows that you're going to give your, your benevolence is going to have more effect than the people around you. Especially if you're a mere private person and not at some high position or something like that. Um, your benevolence is going to mostly affect the people around you, but the, but it's not something that people have to qualify for. That would be justice, right? It's not um, it's not something that people have to deserve somehow. Um, this bestowing virtue. Um, right, so benevolence is kind of like grace, right? Like the divine attribute of grace. Something is given out that, you, that, no, that, that no one deserves. So now, like this one, um, I mean, I don't know if it's right to say that it goes only to those who deserve it, but it does, yeah, it goes only to those who are ready for it or something yeah maybe like you one has to believe that the sun came up to the mountain because of himself to deserve this is the only virtue because then then there then there is a position that from where you can give benevolence you mean to deserve wait to deserve the bestowing virtue you mean to deserve to to be virtuous in that way or to deserve the sunlight? To deserve to be virtuous and then to deserve to be able to practice benevolence. Right. No, but when I said people don't have to qualify, I meant the people who receive it don't have to qualify. Yeah, I mean, I guess the other way, well, no, I mean, you do, so in order to practice benevolence, you have to have something to give. Everyone has something to give. I guess, but it's true. That is, that's part of what I was just alluding to. That's one of the issues about the virtue of benevolence is that, you know, again, I'm thinking especially of Hume here. Um, I think Nietzsche was interested in Hume and, and read Hume. I mean, I know that he uh, has already quoted from the dialogues concerning natural religion, but at least I think that's where that's from. I'm pretty sure, but um, but I think you you know read the second inquiry as well. Um, I'm not sure if I've seen him quote it, but so but anyway, you know whether it's the exact right address for this or not. You know, so like Hume spends a lot of time discussing the fact that in order to judge how benevolent someone that is, we have to kind of like control for the fact that their the social utility of their characteristic is going to be much greater if they're rich and powerful than if they're not. But that's not what we want to focus on when we judge whether they have a virtue or not. But you know, but that's difficult, right? Because because like it's the social utility that really draws our approval. And there's much more social utility if they have much more to give. So, you know, so that, I mean, so I guess you could say this, although this is one of I was thinking, that it's also true that the bestowing virtue that like we give up on that problem. And we say yes, to have the bestowing virtue is to have something to give. And to have so much to give that you can't help but give it, but it just, Flows. I think um, uh, he actually uses the term overflow when he talks to the sun. Is that, um, um, he does when he talks about himself. What's the cup that wants to overflow?
what he actually used to identify. Anyway, right, the image of a cup that's going to overflow. He says the cup that wants to overflow. But of course, like, if, you, if the cup has too much in it, it's going to overflow. <laughs> I mean, it's not that it wants to. So, uh, um, yeah, so I guess you could say from both point of view, there's a kind of qualification for this virtue, both in terms of who's going to have it and in terms of who's going to receive it. They wouldn't be associated with the traditional virtue of benevolence. Um, how much of this should I try to get through? Well, I mean, I don't know. I'll just keep going and try this. Um, secondly, you know, so what the bestowing virtue bestows is, well, okay, so this is complicated. I mean, it. It bestows value. Um, there's two different words that are being translated as value in this text. But one, which I guess actually is the more common one to be translated as value, is merit. Right? That's always translated as value. And um, like, you know, these. Famous things like transvaluation, valuing around again, like switching around the value. Um, and similarly, here, like when he talks about the the dragon, thou shalt, you know. So what it has on its scales are values, and the lion that has to like reject it, has to reject those values, and the child has to create new values, that's all good. But, um, but, I, but in the context of the bestowing virtue, let me see, why do, I, why do I think this is the right context? This is the chapter from a thousand and one goals, but I don't know why I thought that was the right chapter for about the stone version. Well, okay, so you know. All right, so actually, so let me just first say, so the other thing that's sometimes translated as value here is shots, which might more commonly be translated as treasure or something like that. Um, but in the chapter of 1000 and uh, goals, um, Hollingdale chooses to translate it as value, right? So there's a sentence. Evaluation is creation. Here are you creative men. Valuating is itself the value and tool of all value things. So that's all shots and its derivatives. I think, um, and I think that's why I was, this is why I was connecting it with the bestowing virtue. So in the section on this term, just bestowing virtue. Oh, actually, so here's the word value. Let me just see what the word value is.
Yeah, so actually here the word translated as value is vert again, but um, above that it says, so like when it says truly such a bestowing love must become a thief of all values. So that's um, uh, zum Räuber an allen Werten, a robber of all values. But above that, it says, your soul aspires insatiably after treasures and jewels because your virtue is insatiable in wanting to give. So there, right, Shetson is being translated as um, treasures, but it's the same pair that be translated as value and jewel earlier. Now he's translated as treasure and jewel. So what the bestowing virtue wants to bestow is, so the reason I say it's complicated is not clear whether these are equivalent here or not. But I mean, it seems like they are kind of equivalent. That's what he's trying to say when he's saying like, and maybe that's why Hollingdale chose to translate it as value, which you would normally. Um, what he's trying to say is that um, the true treasure is the principle of something being valuable, like being fit to be a treasure. That's what we mostly do. So, and that's what the bestowing virtue is going to bestow. So that is, I mean, it's a complicated thought. It's like the bestowing virtue, you might think it gives you gold and jewels. But Nietzsche says that gold and jewels actually are only worth anything because gold, like gold is only worth something because, or Zaratustra says this anyway, gold is only worth something because gold is a symbol of the bestowing virtue. Um, right, that's what he, he says at the, at the beginning to the sun also, that like what he asked the sun to do is to, um, um, Bless the cup that wants to overflow, that the waters may flow golden from him, and bear the reflection of your joy over all the world. Right? So gold, treasure, jewels um, are only valuable because they're symbols of value in the sense of like a principle of value. It's, value in the sense that, that we use it now when we say like, you know, this is organization share my values, <laughs> right? So the quote, where did you get those values? It's Nietzsche's question. Where did you get them? Someone gave them to you. Someone created them. Now the dragon thou shalt, and again, the symbol for this is gold, right? The, the dragon thou shalt is covered with gold and scales that represent the values of a thousand years. Right now the dragon thou shalt has gathered them all up, but, uh, but someone had to make them originally. So, so that's what the bestowing virtue is, is, is about bestowing. So, I mean, this obviously is again is different from is really different from benevolence in the sense that Hume is discussing it. Right? Like benevolence in the sense that Hume is discussing it assumes that people value some things and not others, that they want some things and they don't want other things. And your job is to give them the things they want and not the things they don't want. Um, but this bestowing virtue is assuming that they don't know what they want. You're going to give them that. <laughs> um, now, I mean, I guess there's one other way 
that this bestowing virtue is different from what we would usually think of as benevolence. Um, and it has to do with a topic that I probably shouldn't be starting to discuss 10 minutes before the end of the lecture, but oh well, which is self-overcoming. Um, Self-overcoming in its prerequisite, self-contempt. In order to overcome yourself, you just have to feel great contempt for yourself, for your present virtues. Remember, there's a, there's a thing where Zarathustra goes through and says, you know, that hour when you say to yourself, what good is my virtue? The uh, true virtue should be passion, but mine is no passion. What good is my justice, etc. And, and he describes that as the hour of the great contempt. Right? So that's necessary because what you need to do is um, um, destroy yourself in some sense. Um, now, I think, I mean, on the one hand, this is kind of, this is some kind of descendant of these other self things, self-knowledge, self-reliance, finding ourselves again. And it's not even, I mean, it's less of a step from these to this than you might think, right? Like, I mean, superficially, you might think, well, these are about like becoming aware of yourself. Um, they're, they're like positive, right? Whereas this is negative. You're just, you're, you're destroying your old self. So the new self may be born, so to speak. And the new self is, I mean, the new self is somehow a self that's above the old self. It's over the old self. You're destroying the old self so that the new one may be born. Um, but, you know, the truth is that even already for Schelling and even more so for Coleridge and even more so for Emerson and Fuller, Finding or trusting or knowing yourself actually is a matter of overcoming yourself as you first find yourself, right? And it is on behalf of like an over self, the true self. Um, so, uh, so this is kind of a logical descendant of these, maybe even not such a big step behind beyond them, but Nietzsche emphasizes that um, um, and I don't know, uh, emphasizes that like how it bites, <laughs> like how serious this is. This, you know, what the bestowing virtue bestows is um, um, your uh, ability to empty yourself or overcome yourself or go down, go under. Interday, I mean, literally means to go down or go under, but it also means to like perish. So that's like translators have a really there's, there's no really good solution to this. Translators have a hard time with the way Nietzsche plays with this, especially in the prologue, right? This was the beginning of Zarathustra's down going. Literally going down. <laughs> but it was also the beginning of his the destruction or something like that. And that's what he received from the sun, from his wisdom. His, you know, uh, 
from his knowledge of, uh, from whatever the equivalent is. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like, it's going to be kind of the opposite of what uh, Plato's philosophers do. It involves going up into a cave <laughs> instead of coming up out of a cave. <laughs> but um, but the outcome of that was this downgoing. And similarly, this bestowing virtue is going to be like, it's like what you're going to give people is the ability to overcome themselves and perish. <laughs> so it's like kind of the opposite of benevolence. <laughs> um, this, I mean, this is part of why, like that thing about nice Nietzsche versus nasty Nietzsche, is that, like there can't be a simple solution to it. Like what we would think of as doing a, doing someone a favor, or Nietzsche may think is, of as doing something bad to them. <laughs> so, um, um, but. All right. Um, I think I finished saying what I wanted to say about the stone virtue in particular, and now I'm really glad to talk about this. I think if I had paced myself better, this would be a whole new section, but there's only like four minutes left. So. But, I, but I do want to talk about, so right, so like this helps explain what this thing about the Superman is, or the overhuman, right, the So the overhuman is, you know, like is over us. <laughs> um, now, um, I guess, like the first thing that's very important to notice about this is that, um, so this is a fiction. Nietzsche can introduce whatever characters he wants. There are no overman characters, right? He doesn't, there's no stories about it either much. And then the Ubermensch can do this, that, the other thing. The closest it gets to that is in part four, as our two straight hears some kind of groaning or something. And someone says to him, that is your childhood, the Ubermensch. You know, but like they never appear. <laughs> so, uh, um, I think you know there's a good reason for that. Like, what's important in the teaching, Zarathustra's teaching about the Ubermensch, is what it means for our will now. I kind of, I think I said a little bit about this last time. I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's what it means for our will now. I mean, like he may or may not. I don't really know what to think about this. It's a similar issue with the eternal recurrence. We'll see when we get to that. Like, does Nietzsche really think of the arrival of the Ubermensch as a future event that we can expect? It's likely that, you know, um, I'm not sure, but what I, I do feel sure that that's not really what he's interested in. I mean, he's, he's not, like, He's not telling us, again, like the reason there's no characters like that. It's not like a science fiction story to get us thinking about what's coming and perhaps prepare us for it or some event or whatever. If it just comes, Nietzsche is not interested in it. What Nietzsche is interested in is, is us trying to make it happen <laughs> now. Um, so if it is a real event, if he thinks of it as a real event at all, he's interested in only in the sense that um, he wants us to become such as we can bring it about. But the main point of this is, as Zarathustra says over and over, the man is something that should be overcome. Right? And then he says, hey, page, this is on page 41, what have you done to overcome it? It's a, as he puts it in Schopenhauer as educator, it's a circle of duties created by those who are above us. 
to bring them about or something like that. Only now, um, um, Schopenhauer is out of the picture. <laughs> Um, there's, you know, the monumental history is out of the picture. We don't have it's like some kind of models or anything of this. They, all we have is ourselves and what we find contemptible in ourselves. But we're powerful enough to find contemptible in ourselves and overcome. That's what's going to create the circle of duties. So that, so, so. Again, another reason why there's no characters, maybe it's the same reason really, why there's no Ubermensch characters is that there's really no content to the Ubermensch other than the overcoming of what we are now. Okay, there's a bunch more stuff to say about this, about the breaking of the tablets and a bunch of other stuff, but uh, there's no time left. So <laughs> see you next week. Have a good Friday weekend.